welcome to the Law Your Money and You. I'm Roberta Sapphire, an attorney in Sharon. And I'm Camille Barron, a health insurance and financial coordinator. And I'm very happy to be here today. Oh, I'm happy you're happy. And I'm happy you're here too. <laughs> so, I am too. Now, yeah, today's it, a great day. It's a it's wonderful good. day. Yeah. And it's even better because of the guest we have. We have a wonderful guest. We have guest. someone who has been in the financial planning business for, I think, close to or more than 40 years. And he's seen it all and, and done it all. He's only 39 and he looks great. <laughs> and Cliff, holding. And holding. And you're holding. That's Cliff Kaplan, uh, also known as CC. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and um, you were named, you're, she said, like Camille says, you're an investment, but you were named uh, top five. Have but I no, got a, it a right? Five star. A five star five manager star. in Greater Boston. Um, and this is, I think, my sixth or seventh year in a row, something like that. But oh, yeah, wonderful. so it's it's an honor, and I, uh, you know, I, uh, um, I take it very seriously. Congratulations! And, well, thank you. And, and you're in the which issue of Boston? Well, in April. So we're Tuesday, doing this show February sixteenth, and it's yeah. in this current issue, the February issue of Boston Magazine. Boston Magazine. Okay. Right. Oh, that's great. That's great. But what we tell everybody here today is going to be good for a few years at least. We hope but, so. But tell us tell us a little bit about yourself and you said your son's with you now. Yes. Tell, tell us all about it. So as Camille mentioned, I have been in the industry. Actually, May, Camille, will be 40 years. Oh, you, you have right to have on the a celebration. Morning. Yeah, 40 years in the industry. Um, and I've been a certified financial planner since 1988. So I'm, a, I'm an old timer wow. in that regard. And as you also indicated, um, I've seen it all. But what we do is we um, help people try to achieve their financial goals. Um, because of my longevity uh, in the industry, a lot of my clients who've been with me for 30, 35, even in some cases almost the entire duration uh, of my practice, you know, we're very focused on retirement income planning. But as you mentioned, you know, my son came to work with me. He's a millennial. He'll be 28 years old next month. And uh, we're actively attracting the millennials who have different ways of looking at things and uh, and uh, so far it's been pretty successful in that regard. So we're, we're really going after Fantastic. the next generation. That is excellent. Hey, what are they going to call kids that are born today? That's a good question. Maybe we can mm -hmm. coin a phrase and patent it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what's your son's name? My son's name is Stephen. Stephen, okay. Right. And Stephen had, you know, he had a four-year um, stint. I, you always like to get some experience before they come to work for you. But he worked um, with Mainstay Investments down in Manhattan. Um, and for those that oh. don't know, they're the investment arm of New York Life. Mm -hmm. So he was there oh. for four years and then he decided he wanted to go into retail. And he used to deal with people like me. Mm. And then he would decide he wanted to work with clients as I do. Excellent. And so he joined my firm. Oh, Excellent. That's, that's good. Right. But as, as I mentioned to you, a few years ago, was it four or five years ago, we did a financial, the beginning of a financial literacy, Brighton Up Club for financial students. Right. And we had a college expert, uh, what are, what are the we got a college investment. planning, a tax, a tax expert, and then oh yeah, and then an investment. Right. And what was surprising after we got all the feedback was they were more interested in the investment than in the taxes and the college planning. You know, you told me this before the show, and I had I had just had a chance to think about it, and in a sense, it's really not surprising because I remember not too many years ago, Jim Cramer. And I, I don't watch CNBC too much because it's of the moment. Yeah. And my, and my practice and my focus is on the long term. But um, Kramer was very, very popular among college students that were really? not even just college students that were um, you know, ma business majors, but all because, you know, it was of the moment and, you know, this hot stock. And, and so um, and with the information so readily available on the Internet, um, a lot of younger uh, investors now um, are very much, very much uh, proactive um, in investing. Um, and one of the uh, uh, really desirable trends and, and encouraging trends that I've seen is that, unlike in my generation when we started, um, a lot of young people um, are much more proactive. They want to invest earlier on. They have investment clubs. Well, yeah, now. they've had investment clubs for years, but the oh. uh, demographics of them, I think, are much younger than they were perhaps when you and I were yeah. a lot younger. Because you asked, what, what is our audience? Right. We, we have young we have older, we have middle, we have everybody. And, and maybe in your topic, especially everybody, you don't have to be young or old to no. do investments. But, but go ahead, and we want to get to a little bit on that Bitcoin stuff that's out. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, why not, since you're talking about younger investors, maybe right. we could start there. Um, can you explain to our audience who may not be quite as familiar with the latest and greatest 
just tell them a little bit about Bitcoin. I'm sure the younger folks might understand it well, better. So let me let me just preface it and tell you say, tell your audience that I am not an expert in Bitcoin. All right, I just did a newsletter on it, and then people go to my website that they'll be able to access it. And uh, I really relied on my son, who has become much more of a Bitcoin expert. But um, so Bitcoin is what they call it, it's the largest cryptocurrency. It's not the only one out there. There's actually quite a few. And in fact, when I when I wrote the newsletter, what's a cryptocurrency? Crypto, it's it's digital. On the internet, it's there's no, it's not a tangible asset. It's not like a coin. It's not anything you can touch or feel. It's on the internet, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. my nobody knows, including me, including experts on Bitcoin. There's there's a, 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 a you know a differing opinion on it whether it's going to be viable in the future or not. But let me give you a, a quick history so you understand why it's become popular. In the midst of the financial crisis in 2008, uh, a couple of things. Number one. Um, you know, it was a real crisis and it was a real fear uh, and it was a legitimate fear that our economy could actually collapse. Unfortunately, it has not. And if that was the case, uh, and, and so what, when, well, what happened is that, of course, we started printing money, not just in this country, but in Europe and in Japan. And you had to wonder about the future value of that money. Was it really what they call fiat, fiat currency? And so one of the purposes of Bitcoin was, well, if we can't trust the central banks that the money is real, we need to have another barter or another currency of, uh, for exchange purposes. And so you know, Bitcoin became, was the first of the so-called cryptocurrencies you know, on, on digital. Uh, others have come since, but, crypto, but Bitcoin is the, the largest in the, uh, as I said, they represent around 50% of the value. The other issue was um, the fact that banks and central banks, like the Federal Reserve, um, would eat up a lot of these transactions in terms of fees. And one of the um, one of the uh, attractions of Bitcoin is the fact that they have uh, everything is done on a ledger, but it doesn't. It's not the transactions are not filtered through a bank or a central bank. So you have these what they call miners. All right, and I'll explain that in a second. Who actually? Uh, and it's anybody who's really uh, obviously uh, highly literate in, in computers um, because you have to really know what you're doing. And they actually implement the transactions and they log in, log them in, and it circumvents the central bank. Okay, mm -hmm. and so by doing that, they earn their money, which is interesting. They get uh, their compensation is earned as they, they get a small percentage of Bitcoin. And I was telling you before the show, uh, I have my own personal accountant's uh, um, son uh, is a IT guy with a big uh, um, hedge fund down in Connecticut, and uh, he's been doing this for a few years. And he has accumulated. Well, he this is about a month ago. I think it's down a lot now, which we'll talk about in a minute. But he'd accumulated something like eight hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. Okay, um, and so the people that again, if they, people go to my newsletter that they can see this. The uh, individuals that the, it's there's a lot of a lot of uh, hype about it, but not a lot of people are making a lot of money. Do you, do you buy things with it? See, I don't know. Well, yeah. So that. so this, yeah, that's a very good question. So there's, there's two purposes for it, and that's, it's it's a store of value. On one hand, but also it was being used for purchases. But um, Roberta, as we speak, a lot of these companies are now uh, who formerly would take Bitcoin for purchases um, mm -hmm. are no longer doing now. In my office, there's a little there's a luncheonette down the street that I go. To. Well, it's not even a luncheon; it's a restaurant. And uh, a few years ago, the first time they heard about it, somebody uh, uh, bought it. You know, bought lunch, and they said, "Would well, you take Bitcoin?" And they didn't at the time. But but many transactions were in fact done in Bitcoin. But because of the volatility. Because since I wrote my news, since December 17th, the value of Bitcoin, I just saw this yesterday, is down 57%. All right. Why it's, do you think that is? It's all about supply and demand. And, uh, and, and you know, if you, and, and, you know you could, there's a lot of reasons you could speculate. Nothing, you know, some of it may be true, some of it may not be true. But again, if it's not a tangible asset, okay, um, how do you really value it? A lot of people have said it's a replacement for gold, mm. all right, mm -hmm. as a tangible asset. You know, mm. because a lot of people would plow money into gold they were fearful of some economic calamity on the horizon. So Bitcoin has been, it's been, you know, uh, uh, theorized that it's a possible replacement for some of gold. So, but here's the, the takeaway I want to give your viewers about Bitcoin. Its rise last year was so spectacular. And I don't care if it's Bitcoin or any type of investment. When you have a rise that's spectacular, it generally has a precipitous decline. And since I wrote the newsletter, as I just indicated, it's been down about 57%. So it went up in 2017. 
And now it's starting to come down. It was up something like, and I, I could be wrong, something like fifteen hundred percent or something. It was some oh ridiculous God. figure, and yeah. it just it's, and and when you don't have anything you can really grab, you know, grab onto, you have to wonder, you know, how viable it is. So mm -hmm. um, the jury is still out. Mm. Um, there so are, there aren't coins going around. There are not. It's, it's all, all computers. It's all on the computer. And by the way, the, the vast majority of people that own them um, own like small percentages of bitcoins. Mm -hmm. And what are they, I think, something like it, again, I might be a little off. I mean, the average person, you know, has like got $30 worth of Bitcoin or something. It's not, it's not a lot. It's, as I said, the two main uh, beneficiaries of this have been the miners, as I mentioned to you, uh, the ones that have been doing it for a while, and also the, the individuals that got in early on. Mm. Back when when you say first... miners, you don't mean miners that No, they, they call them miners. These are the people, oh. the IT people, the, the, oh, tech, yeah. the computer people that actually uh, implement the transactions. Mm. And but it is spelled E. M I N E R. Oh yeah, it's like a mine, it's like mining gold. That's yeah. how they that's oh, how they so got they that. Miners. Yeah, that's, in, that's interesting because yeah. you, you know somebody's going to write they in. They might say miners. I yeah, miners. Miner. But that's the, that's yeah. the uh, the term that's been coined for that because again the the analogy is you know mining gold I guess yeah. or mining silver mm. or something. So um, again, like any other investment, again I don't pretend to know its future. It's, it's beyond my scope. But I do know that anything in my forty years of experience, anything that rises that that much that quickly is due for a huge decline and so forth. That's exactly what's happened. Well, speaking of volatility, and again, the timing of today is, you know, it, it is in February, but this applies any time and right. there. Right. And, and recently we experienced a downturn of the stock market. Um, and uh, initially I think people were, oh no, what's going on? Are we it gonna see a repeat? Up, didn't it? It, yes, and, and I think one of the reasons we want Cliff here is because He's been at this again for 40 years, and we want you to reassure our viewer, viewers that they don't need to panic. Right, so let's keep- Or do they? Uh, <laughs> no, no, we don't no, want them. No. Okay, so good. Let's uh -huh. put things in perspective. Um, the press needs to sell advertising, newspapers, whatever. And so when you have 1,000 point drops, so we had two of them, over 1,000 points. You know, the, the headlines would scream, uh, you know, market has largest point drop in history. True. But let's put it in perspective. When the market's at 26,000 and you're dropping 1,000, it's 3 to 4 percent. Compare that to October of 1987, when the market was around, I don't remember the exact number, but it dropped 22 percent. My point is, it's all about the percentage drop, okay? <laughs> and and uh, even um, uh, uh, the same restaurant I mentioned about Bitcoin, the, uh, the owner, who's, who's the father, uh, approached me last week and he was all concerned about his IRA and I don't manage it, so it's with Fidelity. But he said, you know, I'm, I'm scared to death. It struck a thousand points. And I said, I said, John, I said, it's keep it in perspective here. You know, and, and, and that I, the press does more harm than good, in my opinion, because they, mm -hmm. they, they sell advertising yeah. in newspapers. Mm -hmm. So let me talk a little <laughs> bit about about I'll give you the pros and cons of what I see right now. Oh, um, the cons are that just like with Bitcoin, but not to the same extent, obviously, the stock markets had a had a great run. Last year, the Dow Jones is up over 20%. Uh, we started in January, it's up something like another 7%. Things do not go up forever. Anybody who's been investing in stocks for a long time understands that. Um, it got, uh, stocks became overvalued. Now, that's, you know, uh, despite the fact that the economy is pretty robust, and we'll talk about that in a minute and its impact on the stock market. So it was due for a decline. So, and with, um, you know, with, with uh, all this uh, high frequency trading, the market literally dropped about 10% in a matter of like five trading days. Now, by the way, if you, your viewers don't understand this, 10% technically qualifies as a correction, all right? If it drops 20%, it becomes officially a bear market. Now, those are just sort of arbitrary percentages that have been assigned by, by Wall Street, but that's how it works. Now, meanwhile, as we speak today, it's recovered at least half of that loss, all right? Not to say it's not gonna go back down, but it went way up, before. and that's so the whole when point. it went down, it didn't go down as much right. as it went. Now, up. in my view, the stock, the U.S. stock market, and I'll I'll differentiate it in a second, is still yes. overvalued. Now, I want to again, I want to put perspective on this for those that have been investing in the stock market for many years. This is not a tech bubble as we had back in 2000. All right, uh, where where valuations were off the, off the charts. The market is high, it, it, and, and I and I it is down, it is due and was due. To come down some more that is just natural okay um and i'm not convinced that this bump up recently is is permanent uh, but the market whether it's now or a year from now or even two years from now is going to have a time period where it's going to drop 15 20 percent it's going to happen i i can't tell you when but it will that's what markets do it's overvalued now the other thing people have to remember 
uh, is that the stock market is a leading indicator of future economic activity. So Trump made a pronouncement. He said, we don't understand that the economy is doing well. The market went down. Well, if they do understand. They have Mnuchin there and they have Gary Cohn. Um, they understand. They're just trying to reassure the public. OK, so um, but the other issue besides the overvaluation issue, which a lot of people have assigned to the reason for this decline, is the fact that finally, for the first time since 1982, think about what I'm talking about here. It appears it appears that long term interest rates are going up. OK, and if you know the history of markets, the stock market, uh, the, the direction of the stock market tends to be the inverse of long term interest rates. So, so to, to simplify that, if the interest rates are going up, it means the stock market is going to go down. It's not hard to figure out why this works for those investors looking for income. OK, they'd rather put it in, quote unquote, safer bonds. All right. And they're getting higher interest rate if they're going up. They're going to vacate the stock market, or at least part, partly to put money in bonds, okay? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, it, it, you know, inflation is now, um, I wouldn't even say it's rearing its ugly head, which is what I used to say, because we need a little inflation. A little inflation is actually good. You know, we want to go back to the uh, 1970s. Remember whip inflation now <laughs> under uh, Nixon and Jerry Ford? So we don't want to get double digit inflation, but two, 3% inflation is not bad. It's not mm -hmm. a bad thing, okay? Uh, and we appear to be having that. It, it's a sign of a growing economy. So what I want to tell your viewers and, and make sure they know that just because uh, some of the issues that affect the growing economy that are positive, like rising interest rates, um, may have a negative impact on the stock market. And that's partly what happened. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, how it all filters between being overvalued and, uh, um, and rising interest rates, you know, maybe we'll find out later on when, when they have a chance to dissect it. But I do believe that's the reason for it. Mm -hmm. One other thing I'll mention, let me give you the positive spin on it. There's two reasons why this market could, and I want to emphasize, could continue to rise. Number one, um, the new tax law. New tax nice. law has reduced uh, the maximum corporate tax bracket from 35 to 21 percent. And there's estimates that it could increase um, uh, you know, earnings by uh, half a point to as almost as much as a point in a lot of corporations. Uh, it's been it's been theorized that, or, or been analyzed rather that banks may be one of the, in terms of industries, may be one of the best places to be. So that's one example. And the other thing is, which is um, equally encouraging, is the fact that the global economy, the first time in quite a while, is in sync. Meaning that Europe, which is usually three to four years behind us, is actually growing at a nice rate right now. Um, Asia also, uh, and also the emerging markets. All right, and they're, it's pretty much in sync. And What's so, the emerging market? Emerging market. So there's an acronym that's been around for years that some of your viewers may be familiar with, BRIC, B-R-I-C. It stands for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Those are the really? original big emerging markets. However, there's been some additions to it. You can add countries like Indonesia, Mexico, um, South Korea, um, Philippines, Boy. Vietnam. These are emerging markets. These economies are growing. Uh, unlike in the United States, where we have, unfortunately, um, a middle class which is beginning to deteriorate, the middle class in these mm -hmm. countries is, is actually growing. And guess what? When people are more affluent, they buy more goods and it grows the economy. So these economies are doing very well. Uh, a lot of the uh, companies in these economies are also growing. Um, and that's what I, I'm emphasizing to a lot of my clients. That's one of my major growth themes are, are investments in companies in a lot of these emerging countries, emerging markets. Oh, mm -hmm. Is it riskier? It, yes, so that's a good question. It is riskier. As an example, the market here dropped 10%. All right. Emerging markets equities dropped 12. Mm -hmm. I actually put more money into it because because to me it was a, it was a good buying opportunity. Sure. All right. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you, though, it, it appears now that um, unlike in, it used to say in the past where if uh, um, the United States economy or the stock market sneezed, then the emerging markets would catch a cold or even pneumonia. It's not quite the mm -hmm. same anymore mm -hmm. um, because they have uh, they've they've uh, uh, insulated themselves somewhat from being so dependent upon the U.S. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and so I think this is a hiccup. That's why I said it was a buying opportunity. Um, and uh, and they're, they're very often they're selling to each other. They're selling to Europe. So um, yeah, they're influenced by the U.S. No question about it. Mm. Um, but I, I think the impact is less and less than it was maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. One thing that we get asked a lot is, uh, and it, it's always on the news, uh, speculating about what are the factors that contribute to uh, maybe sluggish growth in the market. What about political uncertainty? When you when yep. you look, oh, say, at question. other countries looking at our country now, right. we have a Congress that is pretty much 
stagnant. They're, they're really not doing a lot. They do nothing and they, in my job. Yeah, I'm being polite. <laughs> um, a, but there's a, uncertainty a, about some very significant issues. Right. How much, how big a factor is that in investments and, and growth of the that's market? That's a good question. There's a couple issues yeah, here. Absolutely. First of all, um, one of the questions that comes up with a lot of my clients is uh, the impact of the president on the economy. We'll talk about Congress in a second. Um, and if you look at history, um, Presidents really have little to do with uh, the economy in terms of its influence. Now, uh, in fact, uh, under Democratic administrations, the stock market has actually done better. Mm. Now, Republicans will say that it was some of the tax reforms or other issues that, they, that were put in place prior to the Democrats coming into office. And some of that may be true. I won't uh, deal with that. But um, in the scheme of things, presidents have very little to do with it. Now, whether you are a Trump supporter or a hater, okay, um, in my opinion, he, when he was elected, and even uh, since that point in time, he's actually, some of his proposals are very much pro-business. Uh, one of them, for example, is a relaxation of rules and regulations. Now, I want to make sure your viewers are clear on this. I'm a big proponent of rules and regulations that work and make sense. But unlike, like, like human be like mo in most instances of human behavior, uh, the pendulum has swung too far on the other side. At one point, they're very lax. Partly the reason why we had the financial crisis in 2008. Now they become much too stringent. Okay, mm -hmm. and so he's relaxing. And my industry is a main focus point, a focal point of that. Um, and, and some of the stuff that I have to go through, I have to, I have to jump through hoops and stuff that is just ridiculous. Right. All right. So yes, mm -hmm. I'm a big proponent of it, but within reason. Okay. So that standpoint, the relaxation of that, and they're, and they're looking at a lot of these, I think, is very, very beneficial. Do you think the new tax law will put more money in the middle class? Because you said our middle class is suffering. Yes. Do you, do you think that? I think the middle class yes. will be fine. I think where it's going hurt, we're, we're in a blue state here. Um, the, uh, yeah. It's interesting. A lot of people have claimed that they put this, this proposal went through and, and they were there to punish the blue states. All right. So, blue states mean middle class. Well, no, blue states mean democratic states. All right. Oh, is that what it means? Yeah, I thought, blue and I red. thought blue collar workers. No, so let me see. And I so, don't so he, even know. Here, yeah. here's my, my take on it. So, uh, you know, we're in Massachusetts. Um, we live in the town of Sharon, where we have high property taxes. Um, many of us, including me, pay high state and local taxes. We have pay excise taxes on our automobiles, and now that number, from what we can deduct, is capped at ten thousand dollars. It is personally going to hurt me a lot. Mm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, but in some other states. Um, where they, uh, in the Midwest, for example, where the property taxes are much lower, they don't have a state income tax, uh, and then the standard deductions are raised to $12,000 or 24000 for a couple, they're going to benefit. So mm -hmm. it's uh, on a state-by-state -state basis. And what I find interesting, for example, is that the state of Connecticut and New York have collaborated. They're trying to find a way around um, get, getting these uh, state income taxes deducted by calling them payroll taxes, which could be deducted on a federal oh, yeah. level. So Should we move? Well, you better, if you want to move, move to Iowa or somewhere, I don't, I don't mean Iowa. to disparage Iowa, but, but, but you know, the people in Iowa are likely, or, or Alabama or Mississippi, you know, again, uh, states that don't have income taxes, uh, that have low property taxes, yeah, no. the middle class there is likely to benefit, but it's going to be on a state-by-state -state basis. Well, that's fascinating. Really? That, you that's you seem to have the ability to just tie all these pieces together Who and connect think? the dots. Well, you know, it's, you talk about, if you remember, you know, we're in February now, but um, one of the issues, and I, I explored this for myself, of course, is that uh, people were trying to prepay some of their property taxes. Yes, that, that was a phenomenon we noticed right. not oh, long ago. Oh, yeah, but I understood on that. And within, you've got to be kidding, and you'll say this is you've got to be kidding. The problem is, is that if you pay an alternative minimum tax. Ah, price, you're exactly right, Roberta. Yeah. That was my problem, exactly. And I, I saw and, as and a you, result. And you, you say... What do you mean? I'm, I'm okay on this and that. No, because if you make so much, they say you still have to pay a tax. So it doesn't matter that you prepaid your yes. taxes. It's not going to help you if you pay the alternative minimum tax. You're, you're which, right on the money. Which we'll get an accountant in to explain that. Yeah. I mean, all, all this stuff, I don't know who came up. The funny thing is, is all these laws and taxes, I don't think the people knew what they were doing. I don't think their accountants are tax people. I don't know what they are. Well, you, you know... <laughs> You've got to be kidding. You, have, you, have, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years, but I still rely on my accountant to run the numbers. Yeah, isn't that and so when I was considering prepaying my property tax, I had him run the numbers. And, and, and I know I was subject to the AMT, the alternative minimum tax. And he said, don't, do, don't bother. It's not going to help you. And, and as a result, I didn't. So your, um, your, your statement is right on. Right. Many, many but I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I know that I end up paying taxes because they say, and I know we did that years ago right. too. When 
I mean, I just couldn't figure it out. You know, you got to figure out how to. Well, the you know, alternative minimum can. tax. I, we don't want to spend because it's very complex yeah. and, and very confusing. Yeah. But yeah. but if you have certain kinds of tax uh, breaks, like uh, long term capital gains, uh, a lot of people that have stock options. Oh yeah. No, all right. Um, are subject to AMT. Uh, those are two of the primary triggers, okay? And, and so, yeah. you, so you're exa- absolutely right. But you, and, and as you said very accurately, usually it's high income earners that uh, are subject to AMT. How come I don't feel? <laughs> <laughs> well, my husband takes care of the stock. That's the, it. He goes, oh, we made money. I go, where, where is it? <laughs> where is it? <laughs> where is it? I didn't see we made money. Oh, give this one, give that one. But... Uh, well, yeah, we're on everybody's list. You've got to be kidding. I think the, you know, the, the, the bottom line is... That's how you've got a, to be kidding. Is, um, how do you like the you've got to be kidding bag? You've got to be <laughs> kidding. Looks like something that. your husband did. Yeah, he did. He did a yes, good job. He did a, he's very good at that. But we, we do do this. I have all these books in it. So you know, we do the police officers are yeah. our friends. We custom make police books, and uh, <laughs> we don't charge the police departments anything. You are so interesting. You know, I keep saying why. Those kids found him more interesting and more valuable information and you you go you got to be kidding well it's the way he explains it i think yeah you well you know, I, I i was i was intrigued and, and sort of surprised when you mentioned that before the show because uh you would think an old veteran like me 40 years in the business um wouldn't be able to connect as readily and easily uh, as apparently i did so i'm uh, i'm flattered yeah. by that yeah yeah well, well it's hard great. to explain this this stuff in ways that most people can understand and i think that's one of the talents that you have oh thank you that's we spoke to our viewers today and yeah. you said Fancy for those who are not interested you know are not familiar with bitcoin right. i'm not an expert but this is what this so is, is what bitcoin i know so bitcoin to wind up because we're going to wind up sure would you say bitcoin is a scam you can't oh no see no i wouldn't say it's a scam it? but no? but because it's new, it's, we've never been there before. It's a new, you know, it's all, yeah, it's, it's the digital age, computer age. Um, there's a differing opinion, a difference of opinion among people that are really in the know. And so I don't pretend, listen, they know a lot more than I do in this subject. So uh, right. whether it's viable going forward, I do know this. There's, um, there's a, 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 a whole bunch of, uh, of cryptocurrencies above and beyond Bitcoin that are coming out sure. all the time. And uh, I do believe strongly that that will get filtered down. All right, because like anything else, it's like any new product. You know, it's something that has uh, a lot of uh, a lot of interest and, and prices are going up. You get a lot of players to join, but when things start going down, they drop they drop off rather quickly. So I think there'll be a handful of players if it begins viable. Um, my gut feeling is it will, but you know, it maybe as a store of value, meaning that as a place to um, to park some assets and leave them alone, at, rather than for transactions that we talked about before. Sure. If I had a speculate that's what i would say would happen perfect ending because yeah. we're at the end of our show believe it or not as and usual very like quick this. yes yeah. and um i'm sure many yeah. of our viewers will be interested in learning more so please oh send goodness. us an email yes. and we'll be happy to connect you with cliff because he is a wealth not to use a pun but a wealth of knowledge about yeah. the, about finances every aspect um please let us hear from you yeah. because we welcome your input remember this is your show the law yeah. your money and, and you, you.